Now the birth of Jesus Christ was thus. When his Mary, mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they had come together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is by interpretation, God with us. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and following. It's a matter of note for you. That was the Geneva Bible rendition. I chose that partly because I want to say a few words with you today about the Christmas season. Reformed Christians, Christians of the, of the Reformed and Presbyterian churches, have a mixed approach to the whole question of annual feasts and of Christmas in particular. Calvin in Geneva kept the five evangelical feasts, the five markers of the life of Christ, as part of the routine of the church there. And that custom has largely been followed in the European churches in the early era. The English church kept largely the entire medieval calendar system, which led in part to the Puritan resistance to those things and to a tendency, therefore, of Presbyterians from the Scottish and English traditions to reject the entire church year, Christmas included. And so there are Reformed Christians who for generations have celebrated an annual feast of the Nativity of Jesus, and other Reformed Christians who have studiously avoided it. I'm not here to talk about whether we should or shouldn't. <laughs> but I do want to set the stage by calling your attention to the fact that while we as Christians of the Reformed churches have great consensus on many matters of important theological truth that we find very easily we can move between the Westminster Standards and the Three Forms of Unity, uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, and so forth. When it comes to the church year, the annual feast system, we've never really come to a consensus. And that's okay. And so we live in a society where there is a fair amount of attack or neglect of the meaning of the Christmas season. And some Reformed Christians are bothered by the secularization of, Christians, of Christmas, and others are rather indifferent since they are indifferent to the annual feasts anyway. But I want to look beyond that issue and have you notice that when the birth of Jesus takes place, Joseph is commanded by the angel to call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then Matthew, as gospel editor, adds in the comment, and this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is by interpretation, God with us, as the Geneva Bible expresses it. In our society, there are those who would like to get rid of all references to Christ at Christmas. So we have light up night and sparkle season. But there are lots of folks who enjoy the customs, the traditions, 
that go with the Christmas season. And so, at least in the rural area where I live, it is not uncommon not only to see Christmas lights on houses, but to see a sign in the front yard. The reason for the season, Jesus. Keep Christ in Christmas. But it is the nature of the modern age in which we live that there is an almost con in a constant and persevering effort to take the language that we have always used, keep using it, but change what it means. To understand the society in which we live, we need to understand that reach, we've reached a place where that which is biologically absurd is called marriage. Now, if we have a society where we take a portion of our bodies and use them in ways that is wholly against the physical nature that God gave us, and then we turn around and say, well, this is marriage. We have in that an illustration of the point that I want to make this morning, that it is characteristic of our society that we keep the language of our Christian heritage, but we change its meaning. What does that got to do with Christmas? Well, the issue for some is, do we keep Christ in Christmas? Well, let me suggest to you that no one's going to change the name Christmas and make it something else that there's no way we're going to remove the Christ language from this season. Oh, some people will try to avoid it here and there, but it will always come back. But it is characteristic of our society that it's not the presence of the language, it's the meaning of the words where the battle takes place. And so you see, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Listen carefully to the language about Christmas in the media. Not by those who are open and avowed atheists and unbelievers, but by those who claim some religious connection, some sense of being in the Christian community. And they will have many good things to say about Christmas except that the human race was in such a sorry condition that they needed a savior from sin. Have you noticed that the issue of sin is virtually absent at Christmas time? And yet it is the very focus of the word of the angel to Joseph. You shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sin. Because you see, it's become true in our society that the way you deal with sin is redefine it, so it's no longer sin. And the only real sin in our society is the sin against the one and only commandment of our secular culture, which is, thou shalt not be intolerant. Listen carefully to the language of public speak, and you will see that the one unforgivable sin is to speak and say things that are judged to be offensive, narrow, bigoted, intolerant. Not that there is some objective standard by which we judge those things. You see, if someone comes to you and says, I'm gay, you're supposed to say, hey, it works for you. I'm okay with that. But you're not supposed to say, uh, I, I really, 
really, really can't accept that. It, it violates my, my religious sense. But we kind of <clears throat> clear our throats and appease our conscience and say, well, I, I really, really can't uh, you know, approve of that. What we don't say is, no, you're not. You are under the wrath and curse of God. And this is, and your sexual perversion is the evidence of that. That'll get you fired from any workplace. <laughs> Thrown off of any TV show. And driven out of whole denominations. But Jesus came to save us from our sin. And the only thing that keeps you from being saved from your sin is saying, I don't have any sin. Why did the Pharisees not come to Jesus? Because they could not acknowledge that they were sinners. The tax collectors were, but they weren't. And so we have this bizarre shift in the meaning of terms where even in Christian culture, the word righteous means someone who does not sin. But in the Old Testament, the term righteous refers not to people who do not sin, but to people who confess their sin and acknowledge it. He shall save his people from their sin. And this whole thing came about to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken through the prophet. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. You see, sin was so bad that it was insufficient to send an angel. It was insufficient to send a prophet, even a prophet as great as Moses. God the Son needed to take human flesh to deal with our sin. Emmanuel had to come with us. And that is the other thing that you will see studiously avoided in all public discussions of Christmas at this time of year, that that baby born in Bethlehem was nothing less than Almighty God the Son taking human flesh in the womb of Mary. And every TV documentary on Christmas you bump into, and they will be all over the channels this time of year, whatever good things they may say will be studious to avoid that point. For you see, if God the Son took human flesh in the womb of Mary to save us from our sins, because nothing less than God the Son in human flesh could deliver us out of our sin and death, if only the coming of Emmanuel could save us, how incredibly intolerant and bigoted and narrow it is to say, I want some other way. Our society professes to be open and tolerant, but in fact, it is narrow and bigoted. It has just changed the meaning of words on us. Think of it this way. If Almighty God the Father, before all worlds, eternally begot of himself his Son, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, one who was eternally begotten, not made at some point in time, who was the Word who was in the beginning, 
and was with God and was God. If God the Father gave his only eternally begotten Son for us, there is a sense that at Christmas, God exhausted himself. Now, I use that word metaphorically. You know I don't mean it in a literal sense. But God gave his eternal son. There was nothing more for God to give. And that son, unlike a human son, was of the very substance of the father. And so we can rightly say that God at Christmas gave himself in the mystery of the Trinity to a wicked and sinful people. How arrogant. How bigoted. How narrow to say, I want some other way. Christmas. Whether we keep the festival with family traditions and lighting up our houses and what have you, or whether, like some Christians in the Reformed tradition, we just largely ignore it. Do not ignore what Christmas brings into focus that we are in conflict with a society that is at war with Christmas not as a celebration, not as an annual event, not as a series of customs, but at war with the reality that God the Word, God the Son, took human flesh in the womb of Mary because we, not just the homosexuals, not, not just the criminals in the jail, not just the drunkards down the street in the tavern. We, you and me, are so profoundly evil and our hearts are so deceptive at tricking us into calling what is evil good, just like our society does. that nothing less than God incarnate could deliver us from that evil. God, the Son, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, almighty, filling every heavenly place, that God made himself as puny and as little as you and me. And there wasn't a thing in us that made it worth it. Because he came to save us for our sins. You see, Christmas, stripped of the traditions, and all the silly controversies in our society about it, Christmas, is the beginning of the gospel. That Jesus, God the Son, came in human flesh to save us from our sin. So whether you keep Christmas or not as an annual holiday, keep Christmas every day of your life. Give thanks and rejoice that Almighty God the Son came in human flesh in the humility of born of a woman, for you and for your salvation. Let us pray. Grant us, Heavenly Father, as we go through this time of year in our culture, that we would seize the opportunities that you give us, first of all, to reflect on the reality of our sin and our need for your Son to be our Savior, and then seize the opportunities you give us to speak that same good news to our relatives, to our friends, to the neighbors in which we have, with, with which we have contact. And grant, O oh Father, that in the midst of all of the outward forms of the celebration of this season, make us 
messengers of this good news to those around us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.